The special thing about the London system is that it's like a car that can be driven by a baby on autopilot, while with proper handling, you can even compete with the Formula One pilots. The goal with this video is to help you understand when to stop the autopilot and uh, how to adapt to your opponent in order to get the most value out of this beautiful opening. In the first part of the video, we will be clarifying some of the most common misconceptions about the main lines. And in the second part of the video, we will be going over the crazy yet common lines for low elo. All right, everybody, back at it. This time facing an opponent, uh, rated uh, 1450, stronger this time. Starts with d4, knight f6, probably gonna be a king's Indian. I'm gonna go bishop to f4, expecting uh, Fianchiaro when they start with the knight. But okay, back into the d5 territory, which I don't mind, not a single bit. Uh, okay, gonna be playing knight to f3. Bishop g4, knight e5, strong move, and uh, okay. He plays the uh, copycat. Can I be going e3? And against, uh, yeah, against e6, I was about to say uh, bishop d3 is, uh, I think, the easiest. This is what I recommend uh, in my chessable course. But on c6, which is not opening up this bishop, not getting any interesting checks on c4, I think you can keep uh, this move. So, it's actually quite interesting. Uh, why do we play c4 instead of the normal c3? And remember that... Um, Okay, generally, as a rule of thumb, whenever the bishop is on f5, uh, you can go for c4 and then quick queen b3, because the pawn on b7 is uh, vulnerable. And the key idea is that on queen b6, you can actually force your opponent to open up your rook, which is different from you taking, opening up his rook. That would be quite good for black if you were to take. That's no good. We don't do that here. But we play c5 instead. And you see the benefit of actually having played c4 because you can lure him into this and now the rookie is just a beast on the open file. And uh, okay, this is super common while dealing with this sort of slav players. Uh, so okay, opponent plays knight d7. Alternatively, he could take, but generally these endgames with the bishop pair are slightly better. Kind of similar to what we'll get in the game. Uh, I'm going to go knight c3. And he has to be precise, he has to go a6 now. a6 and then rook c8 is the theory. Yeah, because if he does not, we can actually uh, really punish him with a quick b4, b5. Uh, because if you try to sort of last moment stop this pawn storm by going a6, uh, like let's say go a6 now, we can still play it. Because after cb5, knight takes on b5. Notice that uh, we take advantage of the pin. So he just castles. Okay. Interesting position. I'm just gonna go h3. I could also play b5, but I want to have like a, an extra square for the bishop in case of knight h5. I'm gonna let him do a6 because I think uh, these type of positions are also very instructive. And if he lets me play b5, I'm actually gonna do it on the next move. There is no more uh, messing around here. Uh, so, okay, knight e4, typical move, just trying to do something. But I think it's just bad because uh, we can carry on with our plan. And most people actually don't realize that we can be winning this in basically like two moves. I'm like not exaggerating. Uh, because, yeah, if black does something like this, I think this is already, we got him in the winning position, so... Uh, yeah, feel free to pause the video and try to find it by yourself. Don't look for like a crazy tactic. It's just something pretty easy that is not going to give him any counterplay, which is yeah, BC. And then, because he has just uh, played that move, I'm considering knight e5 as interesting. And then, you know, like rook c8, bishop a6 could come with a tempo. But most often... Bishop a6 right away, he doesn't have a way to stop bishop b7 and his whole position is collapsing. He's just falling apart like a house of cards. Yeah, bishop e4, I mean, my opponent, he's just clicking buttons. He's just, uh, <laughs> yeah, just kind of out of uh, running, uh, out of any ideas. This bishop a6 is so powerful because 
Our bishops are the typical uh, London system monsters. <sighs> and just like that, you got a free win. Uh, a lot of people actually, I noticed from coaching dozens of players, bishop a6, uh, it's a bit of a blind spot for both colors in this position. But yeah, once you memorize this idea, man, don't you have the best bishops on the chessboard? I bet you do. All right. Pleasant choice. I think because rook a7, uh, he has rook d7 pin. A bit annoying. I'm just going to take this one. Fair thing to take. Okay, I'm just going to recapture my piece. And he's still losing another pawn, it feels like. Rook c8, same, bishop b7. Yeah, knight h5, remember? <laughs> we made the luft early so that this move uh, we don't really care. And uh, yeah. Picking up three pawn. Rook f7. I mean, at this point, uh, we need to bring the last piece in the game. No need to uh, go super crazy, although bishop d7 actually wins pretty big. Wait, bishop d7? Am I blundering? Bishop c5? Yeah, bishop c5 gives him counterplay there. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just going to go king e2 instead. So, yeah, sticking to basics is, mm, yeah, usually best. Just uh, move your king so you can bring the last piece into the action. And, uh, okay, e5, I mean, I can take twice. Problem with taking is that bishop c5 still a bit annoying. So, I'm just going to bring the rook. Carry on with my plan because... Um, I can probably uh, grab that later. No need to actually hurry. My opponent is running out of moves. He, he's in a genuine Zugzwang. Like, this knight has no moves. He plays bishop f8. Now I can trade or I can play rook b7. Yeah, I think simple rook b7. So, I don't want to bring his king closer to the middle. I want to cut him on the 7th rank. Quite a nice little uh, endgame idea. So after he takes, notice that his king is unable to join the game. The rook is unable to move because the pawn hangs. The knight is unable to move. The bishop is unable to move. You kind of get where I'm going with this. <laughs> so yeah, now I have simple cleanup. I can just push the pawn down the board. I can also move here. Uh, I can also like take. I think I'm just going to start pushing. He cannot check me because the bishop moved backwards. Um, so... Yeah, I just want to do c7, rook b8. Unironically, bishop d6, I have rook d7. And then I promote, and bishop b8, I have a uh, back ranker. So, I don't know. Does this feel like difficult chess to you? Does this feel like something that you cannot recreate and logic your way into it? To me, it looks pretty intuitive. That's why I love the London so much. Just because uh, you get these sort of uh, thematic positions... You learn them once and you have a repertoire for a lifetime that nobody can fuck around with. So, rook d8, get in the back ranker. I believe this was also a pretty accurate game. And, uh, yeah, 93. Now, before we move on to the following game, I gotta show you one last idea that can try to stop literally everything that uh, you have seen uh, so far. Which is, uh, what if... Black plays a6, stopping the b5 push. Well, this can lead to a situation where a lot of the newer players are pretty uh, disoriented. So, the point where you may literally get stuck in the washing machine. But in order to solve that issue, I want you to understand that the uh, b7 pawn is Achilles heel in the Slaven game. That... Simply happens because uh, you have an amazing bishop on f4 that is going to keep away the enemy rook uh, from defending. And uh, you can sort of take this as an exercise and uh, pause the video because uh, to get the pressure going, you got to maneuver one of your pieces to attack the b7 pawn. And in case you're having a hard time to spot this idea, we shall uh, start the GPS for the f3 knight in order to find the fastest route. Are you ready? Watch this. So we go. Knight, knight, horse, into b7. And black almost has no way to defend. Let me show you one quick example. So start with the knight. They quite often play rook c8, preparing a bishop maneuver. 
knight b3 and then uh, just to prove the point black makes a random move now you can play knight a5 and it doesn't take a genius to notice that there is no way to actually defend the pawn and uh, if they ever push that is just gonna be uh, weakening the base uh, of the pawn chain and then uh, the enemy queen side pawns um, can start uh, collapsing like a house of cards for example you can play either uh, knight back or even infiltrate uh, with idea to go to d6 outpost so uh, yeah white is gonna get a comfortable edge regardless in the following game we're gonna be talking about one modern idea that has changed the london system forever i am referring to the situation where black goes bishop d6 and uh, instead of doing the usual uh, bishop slide back it is even better nowadays to go bishop to d3 allowing the double pawns let's find out why all right everybody back with another white game Gonna go for the normal London, opening goes e6, and uh, against this one, that may be playing for c5, and then no longer d5. Most accurate is bishop f4, so you are in time with uh, e3. Knight f6, I'm gonna be going for the normal London, I'm gonna go knight f3. Now d5, and uh, we get a game, but uh, before we continue, I just wanted to let you know that uh, I was studying a little bit Kramnik's course before uh, recording today and uh, i also played an hour of blitz against average 2700 players so it is gonna be a fun little session hopefully we're gonna also learn something together okay knight c6 so he plays chigorin typical low elo line i'm gonna go knight bd2 and it's gonna be quite instructive because normally they play bishop d6 or i mean that works too h6 now I want to play bishop d3, but considering the fact that uh, knight b4 is there, that could be a little bit annoying. So I'm going to start with uh, the pawn. Notice that I played knight d2 first, because the knight kind of always goes there. And okay, this is sort of the uh, critical moment that I wanted to really discuss with you. Because uh, I know everybody there get included, maybe dog even, or bird if you have a parrot we'll play bishop g3 which i don't think it's really the best way of dealing with it i just want you to get comfortable embracing this pawn structure you just have no idea how free of a win this is now i know you're probably wondering uh, what is up with this strange dude that is coaching the london and is telling me to have such a weak pawn on f4 I thought I'm supposed to play bishop g3. Well, the thing is, such pawn on f4 is never really weak because you can support it with g3 and voila, it's one of the best defended pawns on the board. And more so why this is actually such a, uh, such a crushing strategy because the pawn on f4 uh, basically stops the only uh, idea that black has to activate their uh, really horrible bishop so if you think about it if not e5 they almost play down a piece and uh, okay this will really materialize in uh, having an attack we have good bishop he has bad bishop our good bishop has extra pressure uh, on that side so now we can continue with a uh, sort of typical move like knight e5 also rook e1 and then knight e5 um, could be a thing. I'm just gonna start with it right away. More than happy to undouble the pawns and then uh, push f4. And okay, on something like bishop d7, um, yeah, there are many ways of playing this. Rook e1, simple move. Mm, idea potentially to rook lift and just get uh, more pieces uh, next to this king. And uh, yeah, just pretty easy game from now on. He takes, uh, I think it's very logical just to undouble and knight e8 or knight h7 only moves for him. Now we have an interesting position because f4, f5 no, no longer comes that quickly with the rook on e1. It was of course better if I had the rook over there. Uh, but this is still uh, very playable. 
Quidditch 5 would be something that I would love to throw in and then uh, bring more pieces, but that allows Queen G5 with a Queen trade. So I'm not particularly interested uh, in the Queen trade. Still something like Rook E3, I think it's kind of a multi-purpose move, sort of staying flexible, not showing my hand, and uh, on Bishop E5 we get interesting decisions, so uh, please feel free to pause the video and uh, try to find the best move here. It's not a tactic, it's just a simple decision making. So the idea is this bishop is going to be out of the game, so I'd rather keep. And now I have attack and this bishop hits pretty much nothing. It's like an active bishop, but is it really though? I don't know. It just feels like, uh, you know, whenever you're trying to study, you bring your notebooks and all that next to you, but you just uh, stay on TikTok instead of actually reading the book. This is kind of similar like what the bishop is doing. And now I'm going to make, uh, I could make even interesting exchange to just have a good knight against bad bishop sort of game. Although, yeah, move like queen g4, just bring the queen uh, with tempo, preparing the rook. Uh, it's probably even stronger. Yeah, let's notice that the bishop is just staying on TikTok. And... Uh, yeah, I want to bring the rook, I want to play knight f3, I want to play knight e5, keep improving my pieces, notice that knight g5 we can easily get rid of it with moves such as f4 or h4, and okay, probably it's best for him to take a passive approach with knight f8, but uh, yeah, the thing is uh, we can continuously improve our position with moves uh, like this. Normally, whenever you have uh, such a strong position, typical mistake is uh, try to do direct blow. For instance, this. Okay, you take a pawn, but seems gets complicated. So, generally, you just want to make these improving moves, like knight could have a much better life. And once you feel like all the pieces are sort of optimized, only then uh, you want to look for like a concrete win uh, more seriously. So yeah, bishop d7 wants chip trick. Me now allow chip trick. Pretty simple. And yeah. Could consider rook g3. Could consider maybe, okay, just barely keep knight g6 in mind. He probably will play rook f8, but that actually kind of allows the fork. Okay, knight g5, f4. Simple move. Uh, yeah, he tries to activate, sacrificing a pawn. Admirable decision, just because he was super passive otherwise, but objectively he's still in trouble. Now probably could take and then maybe f5 idea. Rook f5 could even go queen f5. Um, yeah, getting uh, two rooks for the queen, probably better, but maybe a bit messy. We don't really have to allow that. Probably, uh, yeah, a better approach is just something like... Uh, Queen e2, so that uh, I'm preparing maybe move like g3, have everything defended, and then knight d3, knight c5, potentially. Uh, this part, disclaimer, probably won't be ultra precise, just because I don't have uh, <laughs> that much time remaining on the clock, but I think it should be pretty good. g5, just gonna take, gonna go for the exchanges. Rook f1 next. Rook f1, queen f1. If uh, rook f8, uh, I'll play rook f4 and head for that endgame. Queen e2 also could be interesting playing for uh, his weak king. But yeah, rook f4, simple move. Coming, he's gonna do that. Okay, he didn't. Okay, won that move. Queen g6 allows knight e5. Yeah, I think he had to go for that endgame, otherwise uh, it's going to be even more apparent that he's almost playing down a bishop right now. Okay, knight e5, still playing for that. If queen h5, maybe rook f8, simple move, no? <laughs> the bishop's almost trapped. He's trapped and wrapped. And that rimmed. Bang. Okay, and not even taking the bishop because there is a uh, knight g6, which forces him to give up the queen. So, yeah, I'm just gonna bring my king. Okay, no need to because he resigned. 
So overall, I think this was a pretty clean game. I think you get the feeling that all the time our position was uh, pretty easy to play uh, in this structure. Like notice once you have this move on the board, he's just going to have a dead bishop for the rest of the game. And the way it kind of went, I think everything was pretty good. Important decision making. Uh, this is the kind of key idea that uh, it's just a game changer. Pretty much based on bishop c2 or not. Like whether you trade or keep the bishops. Um, it could uh, drastically change the result of the game. So I'd say you play bishop c2 keeping. Meaning the attack goes on while this piece is kind of pointless. Just a very big chance of winning. So in the following game, we're going to have a look on one of the most common pawn structures that you can get in the London system simply because if you find yourself anywhere below 1500, in around half of your games, uh, when given the opportunity, the black players take one G3, allowing this open file. Now, if they go short castle, you can simply go bishop d3, g4, g5, uh, get rid of the knight, Obvious attack uh, on h7. But if black goes for something like h6 and then they never castle, how the heck are we supposed to attack? Well, that is going to be the topic of the next game. All right, everybody, back with another white game. And open it up with d4 and going to be going for the normal London. And uh, okay, on d5, I like to start uh, with knight f3 and then bishop f4 next move. So. Normal London, uh, okay. Opponent plays c5 line, which is uh, definitely a very solid move. He does get some pressure on the center. I'm going to play e3. It's a question of, okay, will he play normal or will he uh, go for some early queen b6? Because that also becomes an option. Whenever he does queen b6, usually you want to watch out for uh, this possibility of gambiting the pawn. But okay, he goes cd4 and I'm just gonna recapture. By the way, rushing this move is usually a mistake for my opponent because he is first of all releasing the tension, but also he is opening up uh, the e-file, uh, which is gonna give me sort of easier access to one of the most important uh, squares on the board in the London, which is e5. That's usually where the action happens. That's where the knight goes and that's the square that uh, now because there is no more pawn on e3, a rook could support e5 or a queen from e2. It's a little bit more of like a, an advanced idea, but it's in a nutshell why cd4 is a mistake. And okay, now we can simply develop both knight d2 or bishop d3. Usually I like knight d2, it's more flexible and uh, okay, bishop d6. So we have two ways of playing this. There is takes and there is bishop d... Uh, sorry, not bishop d3, but bishop g3 I meant to say. In my opinion, bishop g3 is better here, after having played this quite a lot. Taking and then bishop d3 is fine, it's just that opponent is gonna be able to uh, block, I mean, uh, unlock the position with e5. And sure, you can take twice and be better against the isolated pawn, but I think bishop g3 here it's even nicer. So notice that quite often I like uh, to let them take on f4 with the pawn, so that's why I don't go bishop g3 very often. But when, you know, don't have much of a choice, bishop g3 is fine. So happy if he opens up the rook, and if he does not, I want to play for bishop d3 and knight e5. Okay, never mind. He took. He's probably going to get a, under a monster attack, and... Okay, this is quite interesting, because uh, I could actually benefit from having delayed uh, moving this bishop. Since bishop b5 can be interesting, idea to play for knight e5. However, due to the fact that he can easily unpin, I think uh, we can just develop normally bishop d3 and then something like we need to. It's going to be interesting if he still castles, because I believe there is a potential for an attack. Uh, okay. I could do queen e2 and prepare a long castle. I could do king f1, just staying with the king there, but I think knight e5 is probably the best, just because that after knight takes... He doesn't really have a good square to retreat the knight. Like, he has to play the super ugly knight g8. <laughs> that is rough. 
That is pretty rough uh, when you have to go ninety-eight. It's just like you go outside and then your parents uh, <laughs> realize that you're missing and they start calling. Night eight seven equally awkward. <sighs> okay. Uh, all right. Typical position. Uh, instead of rushing with f four, uh, this knight can actually be improved. So it can be teleported to d four almost with knight f three, knight d four, and it's just a position where. White is uh, better thanks to the extra space and uh, thanks to the more active bishop. So on knight g5, we could exchange, but keep in mind, because we have extra space, uh, we want to keep more pieces on the board. Imagine like you're living in a very small apartment and uh, okay, you're trying to get rid of some unnecessary furniture so you can easily move around without uh, getting your uh, tippy toes hurt. Wait, did I say that right? I'm pretty sure I said it right. So, yeah. You want to basically <laughs> dump your furniture. That's why we don't trade these knights. It's to our advantage, so my opponent is more uncomfortable with many pieces and not a lot of squares. Okay, f6. Opponent tries to do something. However, that uh, opens up the door for a bunch of interesting ideas. So... You can pause the video again, try to find a good move, but I think uh, checking him cannot be too bad. He's going to be losing the right to castle, and then we decide, probably follow it up with f4 and just uh, reinforce the center. Okay, knight back. Uh, interesting. I could, uh, yeah. Go bishop g6, double up on that idea, but simple move, I think. I think just simple move, keeping a strong center, and then, yeah, kind of like whatever he does. Um, we're going to be in very good shape. Okay, considering that he wants to run away, I'm not going to let him run away. I'm going to keep his king tied to defending the knight. So bishop g6, important idea. And when he still wants to badly bail out, yeah, I think this is the position where... Uh, yeah, I can actually just um, pick up a pawn, or when he takes with the queen, cast a long, a rook e1, got um, almost free pawn on e6. Uh, yeah, I think now we can start trading. The main issue about this game is that I don't really have time left on the clock, like not at all. So I'm trying to get him into like a typical French endgame where, um, yeah, just have a uh, winning position because we have good knight against bad bishop. He has a clear target on e6 and okay, rook e7 probably loses to f5. Similar idea. Now f5 picks up the e6 pawn. So yeah, gonna take there. Gonna take on h5 or I guess trade all the pieces. Thank you, opponent. That's really making things easier. Uh, okay, knight f4. Win that pawn, go back to d4. Centralize the knight. The knight is a small town boy, but it also likes the center. That's knight f3, king e5. Centralizing. I'm going to give this pawn as a bait so I can take the other ones. And normally when you're in a situation like this, first of all, you can uh, sort of get rid of the enemy pawns. Just because, um, yeah, this way, uh, even if you lose on time, it's going to be a draw. I'm just uh, deflecting his king right now. I just feel like uh, right now, because I'm quiet, it's... I'm like your dentist. <laughs> I'm doing work silently. And you don't really know... What the hell is going on? Because it happens so fast, but you hope it's going to work out okay. <laughs> so I'm just getting him in the ladder, mate. And uh, my queens are cutting his king. So we can finally, uh, yeah, get the job done. Hope that was clear enough for everybody watching. Uh, I think the game was relatively accurate. Yeah, got a 92. In the following game, we're going to be dealing with the weirdest, yet potentially most common setup by Black for your ELO. Take a look at this. It looks horrendous, but I'm telling you, it's actually a thing. After I have seen 
hundreds of low elo games uh, by uh, coaching people in the London system. I noticed that's a thing. Pawn pushes on the side, pawns not pushed in the center, making it difficult and quite confusing for white to play simply because we no longer have the main idea, the main uh, London sauce, which is 95. So I'm telling you, this setup is a little bit like a crocodile. You don't want to touch it with uh, your bare hands. And ideally, you want to be uh, using a, a stick to see if it's still moving. Let me show you what I mean. All right, everybody, back with another white game. This time facing an opponent rated about 1300-ish. And okay, he plays e6. When they play e6, it could potentially mean that they want to go c5, which we can no longer reply with d5, so we'll have to play e3, but we don't want to lock in the bishop, so for this reason, uh, we're going to start with the bishop on the second move, and uh, all right. But he's doing something a bit weird. I'm just going to play e3 and then something like knight f3. We're just going to get like a normal-ish London setup. I mean, I'm just going to get my knight out. I can set up the pawn pyramid. And this could perhaps be instructive because it seems that uh, this is the archetype of player that does not push pawns in the center. So I know it can be quite frustrating uh, to deal with those uh, if you don't know the plan. So, okay, knight f6, I'm just going to make a lift for the bishop. Since knight h5 could be annoying, I will have a square for my bishop. And then uh, you develop like bishop d3. I could play c3 if I want to. It's just uh, not a necessity right now. And okay, it's interesting to see whether he will castle or not. Because he could also be tricky and yeah, delayed. The point being, if you go short, some g5, g4 uh, could be annoying. Some rook g8 coming. Uh, you can definitely get uh, in trouble uh, against this if... Uh, yeah, it's your first time dealing with such uh, sneaky players. So for that reason, you got basically two ways of playing. You can go bishop h2, just kind of prophylactic move and then castle. So when g5 happens, it's just way slower. You have time to do something else, maybe push in the center. But because knight b4 could be annoying, I'm thinking c3. The only annoying move could be e5, but I think we can simply um, retreat. The thing with e5 is that if you take twice, notice that the bishop on d3 is a bit loose. When you play c3, you need to be aware that uh, the bishop can be vulnerable to such tactics. But, okay, knight h7, I mean, we don't really care that much at this point. Maybe I can castle or play simple move bishop back. Could also play e4. I just want to go bishop back simply so that e5 no longer comes with a tempo. And yeah, against f5, any kind of nonsense, uh, we can castle. And then I'm thinking about opening it up with e4. Yeah, bishop there. So notice how we uh, castled. We got all the pieces developed. And generally in the London, you have to choose between two main plans. Either you go knight e5, not possible in this case because of the d6 pawn, or you break with e4. Those are generally uh, the two main plans that uh, you need to watch out for so yeah e4 if he takes i'm happy that i'm gonna get the knight that's centralized if he does not take i could uh, take go rook e1 and perhaps uh, some queen c2 put pressure on this diagonal uh, so yeah in case of g6 maybe i could switch diagonal and so on uh, white is just better thanks to better development and uh, yeah as promised gonna take with the knight Rook goes onto the open file. Also notice that there is a potential target, uh, a backward pawn on e6. Notice that this is a backward pawn because pushing will normally lose the pawn. So that's why it's called backward because it's sort of fixed. It cannot uh, advance and it's usually just a very easy target. So, okay. Queen e7. When you see the queen on e7, the first thing that comes to mind should be uh, the fact that uh, if uh, we could open up uh, that file, we would have a free queen. So for this reason, uh, d5 comes to mind. If e the knight f6 check, wins the queen after. So d5 forcing knight e5, basically. That's how you want to think about it. Is it so clear what to do after? Mm, not super sure. At least not as clear as I would like it to be. 
before that reason, no need to rush. Maybe we can play a simple move like Queen C2. Queen C2 only directed against some uh, sneaky threats. Yeah, D5, Knight E5, unfortunately, doesn't seem to be that fun. Although it's still better. Um, I feel like Queen C2 would be a better move in this position. Simply playing against Short Castle, because then the Knight's going to be a bit weak, at least some knight d6 idea. And okay, on knight g5, many, many moves. I guess simply takes and uh, give him uh, some uh, check. He's losing the right to castle. Could also play d5. Now d5 is more interesting because knight e5, uh, we can actually win the pawn simply. So I'm not even going to check him. I'm just going to go d5 right away. I think we may be forcing him to play knight e8. But that is immediately very passive, so... Yeah, now we're just gonna take and... Uh, before we take again on e5, we can consider checking. Which is, yeah, gonna lose the right to castle, but I think uh, we'll probably win the queen here due to a nice tactic. Because I expect him after rook e5 to try long castle. But long castle will put him on this vulnerable diagonal. Because you can go de6. And here, bishop takes is lost, yeah? Pause the video and try to find why I told you. Rook e6. And he cannot recapture due to the bishop move. And uh, we're simply winning a piece. And with that, the game. Normally. Hopefully. Uh, yeah. Come on, opponent. Do something. We still have only like 30 seconds, but should be plenty. Hope you guys find uh, this one instructive, even though it may not be like the most theoretical game ever. I do believe this is quite important uh, for your understanding in general as a London player. Just to know how to approach these positions when uh, the opponent does not push pawns in the center. Okay, when they push pawns in the center, it's easy. Because uh, you have all these typical 95 plans and then the game kind of wins itself uh, or it's like more easy, more like intuitive, let's say. But uh, when you know you need to uh, watch out for these kind of tricks that they have or you need to play uh, central with the pawns yourself, it can be a bit more difficult at first. So, uh, yeah, I got to speed up, though. My opponent really wants to uh, flag me, so... I'm just gonna have to play fast. Not good, but fast. Rookie 3, defending my pawn, defending against check. Then I have to centralize my bishop. Okay, I should have taken. Taking was nice. Yeah, king e3, rook d2. Oh, trading is gonna make it easier for me. Should have kept rooks. Now I have easy pre moves. Oh, gonna take king e5. Uh -huh. Bishop d5, try to keep his king away. Yeah, now the rest is kind of easy pre movable. It's, I'd say, I'd think. Yeah, I, I won't really uh, give away my precious thoughts in this position because I just think it's quite uh, <laughs> straightforward. Okay, I mean. I was expecting him to defend that, but he didn't. I'm just going to get a second queen. And I'm going to try to set up the ladder checkmate. Yeah, queen e2. This is simple basic construction. Get the queens like this or queen plus rook, heavy pieces. Now when this is cutting him, you deliver checkmate with the other one. All right, fairly nice. I mean, this looked semi-accurate. I don't know. Let's check it out with the computer. Uh, okay, got a 91 against a non-standard setup. I think that was pretty, pretty okay. So uh, now that you're making quick progress and uh, already have a decent understanding on how to play the normal London kind of games, uh, I think it's the appropriate time to discuss about the early aggression. It's time to discuss about these bastards that throw pawns in our face hoping that they can do everything in their power just 
not to let us do our thing. However, the good news is that in this possession, in the following game, we're going to go DC5, which is as effective as potentially giving us a checkmate in less than 10 moves. Let me show you what I mean. All right, everybody. Uh, long time now. London system. So it is the time. It is the time that uh, we get back the uh, good old... Uh, Possession of London, I was about about to say, but my opponent plays uh, c5, meaning that uh, bishop f4 would this time allow uh, cd4. And okay, it's no longer uh, that simple to play. I mean, there is interesting gambit in that position c3, but uh, the main recommendation in my course is to simply take. And then on knight c6, you have a very tricky idea like uh, pawn to e4. And I mean, this can immediately give you a free win because after takes, we will be taking and he has two ways to recapture. Uh, if knight takes, uh, I do believe that allows knight e5 and common trap for the variation. I had this checkmate in the past f6 bishop b5. And it's pretty funny that uh, the king literally has no moves and black suffers huge material losses, but he takes with the king instead, which allows knight g5 and... You're simply winning back, uh, I mean, not really winning back, you're winning a free pawn. Yes, that's right, you can do the count. White is going to have an extra pawn, and uh, I mean, my opponent also happens to have uh, no development whatsoever. Mm, okay, I can just, just take, I think I'm going to go simple move. I could have also played the, the other knight, delaying taking. But this should be uh, pretty good. And I'll just try to develop my pieces... And keep things very simple. So normally you develop knights first on f5. Uh, I think I'm going to go knight d6 check. To, you know, not move the knight away. Because that allows bishop c5. So I'm trying to like at least give him a harder time winning back the pawn. Perhaps I could also consider uh, knight b5 kind of things going in with the knight. But I think uh, if my knight gets trapped, he could potentially get two pieces for the rook. So that is quite unnecessary. So I'm just gonna go for this version and if he like really does everything in his power to win back that pawn, I mean, we may just very well sacrifice it and uh, he's gonna have a weak king. So yeah, it seems that he is going for it. I think it was better for him um, not to, but uh, anyways, I think he can simply develop. Move like bishop e3. So basically you want to think about it that his very next move is king d6, kind of no matter what. Defending your pawn doesn't help because of a6. And bishop b3, king takes, long castle with check, king c7, knight d5 check. I mean, he's going to probably try to hide on b8. Uh, and then he can play any move, to be honest. And I, I think it should be better just because his pieces are kind of stuck. So we're going to go uh, down that line, starting bishop e3. And uh, yeah, let's uh, see. Maybe, yet again, still better for him not to enter those complications and uh, go knight f6. Okay, after king d6, castling is the tempting thing. But I'm just wondering, does knight b5 make sense? So that we no longer let the king reach the safety spot. The main difference being that uh, this sort of forces king e7, because king e6 allows a fork. And after king e7, uh, we could consider bishop c5 check. Here again, kind of super annoying. He has to play king f6 or king f7. And then I could uh, consider going pretty deep with a knight. So, yeah, many interesting options. I think I'll just prioritize uh, development at this point. And if he goes uh, to the safety uh, bunker on b8, uh, well, I mean, still, it is a safety bunker, but when you have to use the safety bunker... Things are not going great, usually. So, king there. I could start check. I could start check. Uh, I could also play bishop c4. I'm just thinking that his next move is probably bishop to e6. So maybe we can set up a sneaky trap. While also restricting his king. So bishop c4. And the idea is that bishop e6, bishop c5. Uh, I thought it's annoying. Because if king f7, then uh, you can try to post the video and find a good move. Uh, I do believe uh, we had uh, rook d7 in that position. 
using uh, the fact that he's pinned and at the very least after knight e7 we can trade bishops and then pick up the pawn on b7. But he does knight f6 instead and uh, I think he's getting completely toasted right now. Starting bishop c5 and then king e8. Uh, and his king is in a position where uh, only one check is going to be deadly. So uh, yeah, basically it is that scenario where uh, the glass is full of water. Only one single extra drop would uh, yeah, make it break. I guess. <laughs> Something along those lines. You get what I mean. So, knight b5. Uh, and, yeah. I mean, my opponent is in big trouble. He should probably try bishop d7, but then I have at the very least a fork and win the rook. And if anything, like knight d4, I could take and then go for the fork. So, basically, you get to see uh, sort of a thematic uh, position where despite not having queens on the board just because my opponent lost the right to castle very early on in the game we were able to pressure him uh, the whole time so okay knight d4 literally uh, doing nothing so i'm just gonna go knight c7 pick up the rook simple chess the only thing that of course you need to know is how to deal with this sort of annoying second move c5 um because it can sort of delay you from playing uh, these sort of normal London positions. But uh, as you can see, if you take it and then uh, you follow it up with these very sneaky E4 ideas, I'm telling you, like most of these guys in this rating range, they will have no idea what just happened. Okay, just simple move. Now taking because my bishop was attacked and I was thinking to sort of simplify... Can we simplify? Yeah, I think just bishop d5. And if king c5, I'm just gonna defend my rook. Double up and threatening to start um, questioning his king a little bit. I think the king needs a bit of questioning. It's a bit of a brave king here. Rook c4 next. King d6, I'm gonna take with check discovery on the d file. And king b6 uh, doesn't work because the knight um, controls that. Yeah, check. King d6, bishop b7, king b5, uh, maybe a4. Okay, how is the check made? So, a4, king a6 or king a5. Okay, could also start knight c7 and then uh, king b6. Where is the checkmate? Do you guys see the checkmate? I don't know. I'm just going to play uh, a4. King a6 and then uh, maybe b4. Knight c7, and then a5 will be the checkmate. Yeah, is that the checkmate? So it takes knight c7 and a5. Yeah, that should be a checkmate. Notice how in these positions, the pawns are just playing such a huge uh, attacking role. It feels like, you know, pawns are useless, but no, they actually just uh, act like pieces right now against the enemy king. So knight c7 and then a5. According to my calculation, this was supposed to be a checkmate because... All these squares are taken, so, yeah. Okay, get to also deliver the pawn checkmate while using a very sneaky idea. So I hope you guys uh, like that uh, counter. Really something you want to remember, because c5 can be very painful to deal with, uh, as bishop f4 allows cd4 and you no longer get the thematic stuff. I'm going to quickly pop in a game review and see what happened. Um, got a 94, so uh, that's actually not too shabby so uh yeah with that being said i think we can move on to the following game hey now that you made it this far into the video we seriously need to talk everything that we discussed so far is completely pointless if you are unable to humble this england gambit clown so for the love of jesus let's refute it finally once and for all back with another white game and gonna be dealing with the England. All right, fine by me. I guess uh, you guys really wanted to see the refutation of the England anyways, haven't you? Haven't you guys wanted that? Isn't that what you wished for when you clicked on this video? I bet you did, subconsciously. So, uh, okay, Queen 7 So you have basically many ways of dealing with the uh, England. 
Uh, if you don't want to worry about theory too much, you can just give back the pawn and play like knight c3, allow knight e5, and then simple move e4. Basically arguing that the queen on e7 is uh, stupidly placed, blocking the bishop. But because uh, I know that you guys have been suffering through so much trauma and all that, I'm going to refute it. <laughs> I'm going to go bishop f4. I know you guys need some redemption against the England guys, so important to play bishop d2, not to hang uh, the bishop, because uh, queen b4 uh, yeah, was coming with a bit of a multiple threat. And then important to stay away from bishop c3, you probably know why, because <laughs> bishop b4, queen d2, he takes, and then there is this famous trap with queen c1 mate. So yeah, knight c3 key move, once you make it to this point, it's pretty much almost impossible to mess it up. Uh, okay, he goes bishop b4. Additionally, knight b4 is another try for them, where, uh, yeah, you know, it's like they're putting uh, their all savings on a single roulette spin, because you just need to defend uh, the pawn with knight d4, and when they try to hit the knight, don't move the knight, because you lose the queen after knight c2, but play rook b1 instead. And the queen has to move, then knight b5, queen a5, a3, the knight has to go, knight d5, and it's genuinely resigning. So bishop b4, key move, uh, just as in the same position that we were discussing, rook to b1 to begin with. And uh, yeah, he goes queen a3. Against the queen sack, I'm not particularly terrified. You can take and then play knight e2 uh, and go for some rook b3 stuff, maybe fianchetto. Uh, I even had a game against Aman in that, and uh, it didn't feel hard to play for white or anything. So queen a3, and now key move. Most people here mess it up. They go knight b5, which is playable but not that uh, yeah straightforward in my opinion i like knight d5 better because it's also putting pressure on the bishop so normally black players take on d2 and then play like king d8 so let's see yeah bishop d2 uh, important here to take with the queen typical mistake uh, to take with the knight and then it's just uh, putting your knight on a slightly more passive square while also no longer protecting that pawn so yeah normally king d8 or queen a2 interesting uh, try for him the point on uh, queen a2 is to stay away from uh, the temptation knight c7 because then you're actually lost after king d8 takes queen a1 and the issue is that in this end game your knight on a8 is getting uh, picked up with b6 bishop b7 so important that on queen a2 you simply don't care you go rook d1 and then he has to go king d8 and you get similar position like we will probably in the game so just e4 now yeah i'm gonna see that rook d1 basically you need to understand that okay our opponent's uh, king is weak in the long run and you don't have to try to do something like immediate about it. Uh, that's actually the way to mess up the England. Because it's tempting to go some knight g5, forget about knight e5. Uh, yeah, kick when he does, attacking the rooks, rook d1. Keeping some pressure. Just think about his position. It's genuinely impossible for this bishop to develop. And okay, queen a5, interesting try. Like he is up a pawn and he offers the um, endgame. Do you guys think we should allow the endgame? Uh, I think it's pretty obvious for most people that uh, no. We don't want endgame down a pawn. We want to keep queens on the board so that we can uh, uh, play uh, against his king uh, in the future. So c3, simple but incredibly important move to uh, kind of keep the flow of the initiative going. And then you just go some bishop e2, castle. And as I was saying, a lot of the times... Uh, you tend to go wrong about this while thinking, okay, how am I supposed to win? What am I supposed to play? And uh, you enter this uh, sort of, uh, let's call it a very money-oriented uh, <laughs> mindset, which sometimes it's critical, but otherwise, uh, yeah, life just goes uh, next to you without you even realizing it. And okay, he plays B6. I was thinking to mention this trap, but uh, yeah, we can actually give it as an exercise. He'll probably play bishop b7 and then uh, we have a nice uh, little winning move. So I'll kindly ask you to pause the video and find that. Uh, 
but yeah, my point was, uh, okay, first of all, bishop b7 allows knight b6, because d7 is no longer defended and there is mating net, so he plays something else, and where I was going with the uh, full uh, money-oriented mindset, uh, the problem is that, uh, okay, you don't stop and ask yourself, what is my opponent doing, like, can he actually make any moves? Is he completely packed? Is he completely tied down? Sometimes only if you play a move like h3, asking him what to do, you realize it's not obvious at all. Like for instance, for educational purposes, I could do h3 now. But it just feels like maybe I could look for a mating net perhaps. Like knight e5, queen f4. I just told you not to do that, okay? No, let's, let's do educational purposes. Let's do h3. What is he gonna play? Very curious to see. Okay, knight g6. So he has a plan. He wants uh, to take e5. Interesting. Um, yeah, I think maybe simply knight g5 now. And then the point is I can meet knight e5 with f4. And I'm sort of winning a piece by the looks of it. I just have to speed up because there's no more time on the clock. Sadly... Although this is this is pretty good stuff. I feel like uh, a lot of you guys are really looking forward to punish the England in your future games. So yeah, h6, I believe we should be good after queen g5, something like that. Yeah, okay, just take, important. Yeah, he's completely packed. Do I have queen e7 mate? No, I have even a nicer one. Pause the video! Oh, never mind. Oh, yeah. This is even uh, nicer. Oh no, I just blundered. Holy smokes, I blundered. He has queen c5 check. I have to go back. I'm still winning, but I didn't really want to allow that. Oh no, will he find? I'm threatening queen e7 mate otherwise. If he checks me on c5, I have to go back because the knight is dependent and I just forgot about that. Oh no. Okay, queen c5 check. I'll have to really remove it. Oh. It was at this moment, he knew. He fucked up. <laughs> okay. I mean, thanks everybody for making it this far into the video. I'll just leave you with the key takeaways. And uh, if you're looking for something with the black pieces that's quite similar, check out this video.